Closing here? Yeah. It's running. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So we're going to start now. Uh, so uh, I'll be uh, I'll make the opening. Uh, sorry, I'll make the welcoming remarks on behalf of the Society for Armenian Studies. Mark is going to do the welcoming welcoming remarks on behalf of Nasser and. So we now will do the uh, opening remarks of the conference. So if you don't know, the Society for Armenian Studies was established in 1974 by a group of Armenian Studies scholars. And the aim was to promote uh, the research, teaching, and the methodology of Armenian Studies. Since then, the Society has been very active. I became president in 2018. And uh, we have many people here who were part or part of uh, uh, SAS on the EC, at least we have Christina here, the Vice President of Society for Armenian Studies. Zobinar was the Vice President uh, in the past, so we have many people who are uh, involved in SAS leadership. And uh, SAS is a very uh, strong organization today. We uh, provide scholarships, uh, convene conferences, uh, symposia, talks, uh, podcast series and many other aspects that you can find on our website, Society for Armenian Studies. Uh, today's conference is the uh, the idea of the conference was uh, brought to SAS by Zobinar Derderian and Christopher Shaklian about two years ago, as far as I know, and due to COVID, we had to delay it uh, for today. For today, meaning in the I can't say post COVID because we are living in the COVID period now. And uh, so I just I, I just would like to thank a few uh, people and individuals and organizations which make this conference possible. The title of the conference is Technology of Communication and Armenian Narrative Practices Through the Centuries, which is a new topic actually, or which we have never done a conference upon. This is not about the you know Armenians in the Ottoman Empire, Armenian genocide. This is a new topic, uh, and that's where Zolinar and Chris come into just giving birth to this topic. So uh, before I give it to, uh, hand it to, uh, not, uh, to Mark, uh, so basically as you can see, the uh, organizers are Society for Armenian Studies and the National Association for Armenian Studies and Research. And this is the first conference in this beautiful building. And it's an honor to hold the SAS and Nasser co-sponsored uh, conference in this building. So we are really very impressed by the building mark. I wasn't expecting this, you know, the amount of space that you have here, the amount of uh, facilities, uh, everything seems to be extraordinary. And it, this is, I think, a unique place in the whole United States, if it's not the Western Hemisphere. And uh, uh, it's really uh, groundbreaking, I should say, and I'm looking forward to future cooperation with Nasser on different uh, issues. Uh, I'd like to thank the University of Southern California Institute of Armenian Studies and Safi Ghazarian for co-sponsoring this conference. I'd like to thank uh, Professor Christina Maranchi, the holder of Mashto's Chair in Armenian Studies at Harvard University for co-sponsoring. I'd like to thank Barudir Magadichan, the Armenian Studies Program Director from the California State University, Fresno. I'd like to thank Professor Uri Berberian from the California... Uh, uh, California... University of California, Irvine. I'd like to uh, uh, thank Krikor and Zohrab uh, Information Center and Director Jesse Arlen from New York City for sponsoring. And last but not least, I'd like to uh, thank the Center for Armenian Studies, University of uh, Michigan and Harvard for co-sponsoring. Of course, any type of conference is easy to just put co-sponsors, but there is really a lot of work that goes into these conferences. I'd like to thank Zovinar and Chris organizers of the conference. I'd like to thank Mark Mamikonian uh, for uh, really doing an uh, amazing job. I'd like to thank Barbara Dermogradishan too, who always plays behind the scenes. Uh, there he does things that we don't see. I've uh, always been like that in the past 30 years. And I'd like to yes. thank to, uh, also Kat Katarina Terzian, our executive secretary. And uh, we've, I think we've done an uh, amazing job here. Uh, the unique aspect of this uh, uh, conference is, is that we have a lot of guests from Armenia 
And I should say that our thoughts are with Armenia. I'm not going to say our thoughts and prayers because thoughts and prayers are not doing anything as far as I understand. But our thoughts are with Armenia, specifically in this difficult time when uh, Armenia is under the aggression of the uh, Azeri regime, Aliyev's regime. And we hope that the future would be more bright than what it looks in the, in the new future. So thank you for all our guests from Armenia, Shnoragarit Borigak, Boston, Yev, Ruzey Yekupara, Asil Hayrenov, Urahim Borastavi Kutnevik, and Nasir Imej, as Kitajo Borobat Kazmakir Batza Hayaki Devan Usman Sinkir Tjaniev, Nasir Kormeyev, Dark Perovish, Amerigian Hamasrani Hayaki Devan Ambioneru Gormane, Uremen Gusan for Love Jamana Gurina Kaster, Love Kitajan. Before I floor is yours. That has the charger for the. Well, we're taking pictures for each person it's for PR purposes. Oh, it's here, Ani. Never mind. You're going to say all that again? Yes. <laughs> 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 I never do this, but it's important for Nasser's pure purpose and SAS. I'm, I'm happy SAS. I, I feel that that looks kind of post. Yes. Uh, I'll take a picture of you, don't worry. I took a picture. Oh, for Mark. Yes, I took, I took a picture. Yes. Yeah, I hope that wasn't in the picture. I took a picture of you over Mark. Okay, all power will not be lost. Very good. Well, thank you, Bedros, and. Uh, I won't repeat the list of names and organizations who are to be thanked, but I certainly thank them all. Uh, but I do especially want to thank Lovinar, Chris, and Bedros for uh, all their work in, in bringing this conference together. Um, I'm not going to give you a long history of Nasser, since some of you know it reasonably well anyway, but the long and short of it is that Nasser was started in 1955 for the purpose of establishing Armenian studies and promoting Armenian studies, first of all in the United States at that time, and then eventually everywhere uh, through the establishment of Armenian studies chairs and programs and supporting them, uh, organizing or, uh, educational conferences, lectures, and other events, and eventually developing a center uh, and a library and the bookstore through which the research being generated could be disseminated, made use of, uh, and you know, fast forward a few decades, we built a new building. And as Bedro said, this is the first conference that's taken place here uh, in the building. And as I said to you uh, earlier, the goal was for this building to be outward looking and welcoming. A uh, place that people, scholars, non-scholars, community members, non-Armenians, anybody who wants to come here will feel that they have a place to come and be welcome and to get help finding what they need. Uh, there's really nothing that gives us more, <laughs> more pleasure than assisting scholars in their work uh, or assisting a high school student who's writing a report with his or her work. That's just the base of what we seek to do as an organization. So we still refer to this, the Vartan Gregorian building, as the new Nasser building, because it is new, but it's really even newer than the fact that it opened uh, almost three years ago would suggest because of the pandemic. We were largely closed throughout the past couple of years until this spring when we were able to be more open to the public. Uh, we've done very well collaborating with the SAS, collaborating with other groups and on our own in having online programs, but it's great to have people gather in person again. Uh, we love our new building, but much of the real work of NASA is not located in 
this building or any other building, but it's in the minds of the scholars and the scholarly community that we always want to serve. So, this is your home away from home. I hope your office away from your office. Uh, and please, I invite you to, to think of it as such. And I will now ask Zobinar to open the conference proper. Thank you. Um, welcome, everybody. It's, uh, I'm really glad that we uh, managed to bring as many of you as possible here. Uh, as Bedros mentioned, this, uh, the idea of this conference, the theme at least, uh, has been in progress uh, for at least two years. Uh, and we thought about doing it online, but really, uh, I think it was very, both Chris and I thought it was very important to do it in person um, because a lot can come out of uh, conversations. So um, I want to specifically thank uh, Mark and Bedros uh, and Chris Cheklian for um, all of their work uh, to organize the conference. I want to thank the participants because we had very uh, little means to organize this conference and they, everybody contributed in their own ways uh, to be able to um, make their way um, to the area. Um, um, and I want to thank the participants for all the work they've put so far and, and looking very much forward to uh, the conversations we'll have around everybody's paper. I want to thank the discussants, uh, Mark Mamikonian, Christina Maranci, uh, Lerna Ekmekcioglu, and Nora Lessersen. Uh, the idea of this conference really came um, with the intersection of my and Christopher's, uh, Chris Shekian's interests. Uh, on how forms and mediums of communication have shaped various Armenian communities and how Armenians in turn have shaped those mediums and genres of communication. So I hope throughout this conference we will look beyond the text, look beyond what the texts are telling us and think about the way uh, mediums and genres of texts affect societies, politics, culture, economics. Um, I don't want to keep uh, uh, too much uh, of, our, of our time on introductions. Um, um, and one, I want to remind everybody that e everybody is asked to keep their uh, talks limited to 15 minutes. Uh, um, as had been noted in earlier emails, uh, we decided uh, instead of having a keynote speaker to have a concluding uh, um, hour on discussion. Uh, um, um, of the uh, papers and coming to uh, conclusions from the discussions we've had. I'm glad that we've been able to gather people who work on very different periods and geographies. I think it's very fruitful to have these kinds of intersecting um, discussions in Armenian studies and to think about Armenian studies in methodological and thematic ways rather than fo um, merely focused on time and uh, geography. So, welcome everybody, and I'm really looking forward to our uh, discussions and to learn from you. Thank you. Well, hello again. Uh, it's my uh, task, my privilege to chair and be the discussant for the, for the first session on narrative practices and power. And I just want to give the briefest of introductions of, of uh, our four speakers in order not to uh, impinge on, on their time and on discussion time. And we'll have them go in alphabetical order. Um, our first speaker, Armen Apkaryan, uh, presenting Forging the Crown of Tolorma, Varam's Chronicle and the Creation of Cilician Armenian Kingship. Armen is a doctoral candidate in history at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. Dr. Asya Darbinian, presenting stories of refugee struggle and assistance through the periodicals of Imperial Russia. Asya is a visiting professor in Armenian Genocide Studies at Clark University in Worcester. Dr. Hasmi Kalapian, is, uh, presenting narratives of atheism in forging a Soviet Armenian citizen, is assistant professor at the American University of Armenia. And Dr. Harutun Marutian, 
is speaking on visual forms of communication as a tool and sign for revolutionary change, and he is the director of the Armenian Genocide Museum Institute in Yerevan. So I will ask Armen to come up, and I will get his PowerPoint. Hi everyone, I'm Armin. I'm uh, very excited to get this panel started. And uh, today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Bahram Rabuni's uh, history of the Rubenians and the uh, creation of the Cilician Armenian kingship. So this presentation is part of a larger project I'm working on for my uh, PhD dissertation, which looks at the relationships uh, between concurrent models of kingship that existed in the medieval Eastern Mediterranean. And specifically for my project, I'm going to be looking at um, how these uh, models interact in Armenian manuscript sources. Um, but uh, more than just how they appear or how, they, uh, how, how Armenian sources engage with these different models, I'm also interested in the manuscript production itself. Questions like uh, what sorts of manuscripts are being produced, where are they being produced, when, by whom, for whom. I believe that these sorts of questions can help shed light on to, first, uh, first of all, how far the reach of some of these models of kingship were, as well as how uh, broad their appeal might have been in different uh, geographic or uh, chronological uh, concepts. In uh, context, sorry. Uh, so, but before I move on to talking about Bahram's Chronicle, let me give a, the briefest background information on uh, the Kingdom of Cilician Armenia. So, uh, Cilician Armenia was a first it started off as a fiefdom in the 11th century, and it uh, became a kingdom in the late 12th uh, century and lasted until the 14th. And it comprised the territory, roughly, of southeastern Anatolia, modern-day Adana, Turkey. Uh, and the, um, uh, and it, it's, it's largely where the narrative of our chronicle takes place. So, talking about history of the Rubinians itself, or as I'll refer to it from now on, Bahram's Chronicle, just for convenience sake, it was written by the secretary of uh, King Levon II of Cilicia, whose name was Fahram Rabuni. Uh, the poem is a 1,420 line monorhymed versified history of Levon's, Levon II's uh, family. And uh, it begins with the fall of the Bakratid kingdom uh, in the uh, mid 11th century, and it goes on until. Levon II's accession in the latter half of the 13th century. And what uh, particularly drew me to this piece to when I wanted to talk about Cilician Armenian kingship was the way that uh, the, the kingship, the ideal model of kingship is expressed in this piece. Um, it is largely expressed first by various um, behavioral uh, perform uh, performances of kingship. Uh, these are things like martial prowess, uh, performing piety, and having the right genealogy. And uh, it also projects its uh, model of kingship by means of literary techniques that would have been common uh, in the region outside of a Cilician context. So what I mean specifically is that uh, the poem itself uses various poetic techniques that are reminiscent of the Persian of Asideh genre of poetry. Um, so let me get into a little bit about some of these um, elements of performing kingship that appear in, um, in, in, in the poem. Uh, the first is martial prowess. So one of the major thematic elements throughout the um, throughout the poem, is this idea of Armenians being subjugated. It's this idea of Armenians living under oppression. First, 
uh, the poem opens up with the fall of the Bagratid kingdom and a mass exodus of Armenians who would prefer to live, it says, in other lands rather than live as slaves in their own lands under the Seljuks. The story then picks up with uh, the now exiled Gadik II uh, of the Bakratuni family living in uh, Gesaria and uh, his conditions living there in a sort of a, in a sort of a second class status that um, that there are these sense of like ethnic tensions between the local Greeks and the new uh, Armenians there. Um, however, the fortunes of the uh, uh, the fortunes of our protagonist take a turn following uh, Ruben's flight from Gesaria. So Ruben is introduced as a member of the royal family, as a member of the Bakardoni family. But once he sees the outbreak of, uh, of, of violence between the Greeks and the Armenians in Gesaria, he goes and he establishes himself in southeastern Anatolia and begins the process of consolidating his power. And this begins the arc of, uh, of moving from a state of subjugation to a position of you know, geopolitical dominance. And how this, uh, how this plays out in the poem is usually episodes where the current lord of Cilicia will win a military engagement against superior numerical forces. These forces are usually always non-Armenian, and uh, after the defeat of the non-Armenian foes, usually it's Greek or it's Turkish, um, it, it, it ends with either the liberation of Armenian captives or the uh, pardoning of Armenian rebels who may have sided with, um, with the, the enemy. So for example, if I could just draw your attention to, sorry, I'm a little laser pointer here, got it. Okay, so uh, this, this excerpt here, my translation of it is uh, on the left hand side. Yevpazmuchan zoratsan haftial zamenesian tserpagalian. So we see here that this is just one example of, uh, of such a military engagement, right? Where the entire Greek force is essentially killed wholesale for the, um, for, for the benefit or for the security of the, um, of the Armenians in the region. Um, so... Moving on from this, having so it, it shows that one of the primary um, expressions of performing ideal kingship, of ideal rulership, according to Bahram, is to safeguard the security, the physical security of the Armenians, and the um, overall trajectory is one where, as the Cilicians begin to consolidate their rule and centralize power under first the lords and then the kings you see a change in the fortunes of the Armenian people in Cilicia. Um, this is also sorry, uh, expressed through um, performances of piety in the, uh, in, in, in the Chronicle. So pious performances of kingship take the form either of uh, performing miracles, of uh, patronizing monasteries and churches, or of, um, or of uh, providing charity or food or medical care to the poor. Uh, and this usually comes after a military victory that uh, a Cilician lord or a Cilician king um, has. So for example, in this excerpt, we have... Um, uh, I live Sevanan and Tarzakyal, Vorov, so, um, this excerpt uh, follows immediately after a section talking about how this Lord is enriching the uh, ecclesiastical institution. So there is a pairing of this charity with a sort of a religious sense of duty. And so... Um, uh, I, I believe that uh, this, is, this is another example of, uh, of uh, performing ideal kingship because uh, Vahram discusses the, uh, 
the uh, Armenian Christians here, it, the, the religious aspect of it becomes a part, of, like a, a way of, um, becomes a way of designating this community. Um, so let me move on to uh, the third aspect of performing kingship, and this is the specific genealogy of the Cilician rulers. So in general, this is how the narrative of the uh, chronicle goes. So it begins talking about the fall of the Bakratunis, and then uh, it moves on to talking about the um, the Ruben is the descendants of Ruben who are able to establish a presence in Cilicia, and it's followed by um, a new family taking over. So this this is this is a really interesting uh, point in the chronicle because up until this point, um, the chronicle it describes the protagonist in terms of their patrilineal succession, that everyone is a descendant of the Lord Ruben. Uh, however. In fact, the name of the chronicle is History of the Rubenians. However, at a certain point, the daughter of Levon I becomes the sole heir of the Cilician kingdom and is married off to another noble, uh, a noble named Hetum, who is not of the Rubenid family. Um, however, this Hetum nevertheless plays a role in the chronicle. He's a major character and in fact becomes the father of the patron of the Chronicle, Levon II. So, how does this play out when the name of the Chronicle is History of the Rubenians, and yet the patron is not a patrilineal Rubenian? So I would argue that uh, what Vahram does is that he, in a sense, assimilates Levon II into the Rubenian family. So while Hetum himself, the father of Levon, isn't a Rubenian himself, he ends up fathering Rubenid. He ends up marrying into Rubenid and judging from his actions like the, the campaigns he uh, embarks on, his uh, patronage of monasteries, his diplomatic connections with the Mongols and so on that come up in the uh, chronicle, he carries on the, uh, the mission of the Rubenians of sort of consolidating rule, of providing security for and prosperity for the local Armenians. Um, but then that leaves the question of what to do with the Bakratunis. If the Hetumids become assimilated by the Rubenids, are the Rubenids then assimilated into the Bakratuni family? And to this I would say also yes, but not to the same extent. So, the, so when talking about the, the Bakratuni connection to the Rubenids, um, it helps also to... Five minutes? It helps also to think of. Um, it, it also helps to think of how the kings of Cilicia style themselves. And uh, here, for example, is a uh, another um, another excerpt talking about the enthronement of Levon II. So it says, "Vort i darson mi avanyal yev andanor ezna otsial." So this is the, the name that I really want to focus on is Torgoma. Um, who is this Torgoma? So Torgoma uh, first appeared to me in, the, uh, in another Armenian chronicle, the uh, Moses Horonazi's History of the Armenians. And in this, uh, Moses Horonazi talks about a, tries to form a biblical genealogy for the Armenians. And the way this works is that, to, that the descendants of Haik, who was the mythical patriarch of the Armenians, was himself a descendant of Torkoma, who was himself a descendant of Japheth, who was a son of Noah. So in this way, he's able to create a biblical genealogy for him. Um, however, at the same time, he, uh, Horonazi also writes in his chronicle that the Bakratunis do not descend from the line of Torkoma. Uh, that they descend from another biblical line, this time from uh, the Jews who uh, were, became exiled as a, as a result of Nebuchadnezzar II's attack. So he creates this division between the, um, the, uh, the Bakratunis and the, uh, the rest of the uh, people of Armenia. Um, what ends up happening, though, is that the, Arm uh, that the Bakratunis end up serving 
uh, the kings of Armenia throughout Koranazi's chronicle as you know, hereditary coronets, that they end up taking on this position of service. And so I argue that the Rubenids and later the Hetumids, likewise, while they, the, the title Tagantor Goma, to me, uh, doesn't necessarily talk about the genealogy of uh, the uh, of the Rubenids attaching to Torgoma, but a, a sense of a stewardship over this uh, group. Um, so let me two minutes, okay. Let me just wrap up with this: um, that uh, the the elements of Persian uh, Vasides that appear in uh, this chronicle. So really quickly, what a, roughly what a Persian Vasides looks like is that it's twenty to sixty lines. It's in a monorhyme structure, and the poem itself is divided into three parts. So you have the occasion for the composition, you have the actual panegyric, and then at the end you have the, um, the uh, author basically demonstrating his own literary skills. Similarly, you have that uh, taking place in Vahram's Chronicle. So although it's much longer than 60 lines, it nevertheless does follow a monorhyme structure, and it does also follow the three-part structure. So it opens up by with the occasion, which was Levin being inspired by another versified history. Um, it uh, moves on to talking about Levin II's prestige by um, panegyrizing his entire family, and finally it ends with a rhetorical polemic against apocalypticism, thereby showing uh, Fahram's own uh, skill as a, uh, as a poet. And so the reason why I want to bring this up is not so much to say that there are these uh, analogs between Persian poetry and Armenian poetry at the time, because although there are, I want to talk about a broader, um, a broader common language that uh, people were uh, engaging in. Um, that uh, a broader common language that people were engaging in. That in a sense that, uh, that Vahram was able to make use of these uh, poetic conventions that were, uh, that were markers of prestige, markers of power in the region uh, in order to express uh, his king and his dynasty while at the same time maintaining the boundaries uh, between uh, Vahram, but between uh, Levon and the rest of the uh, political entities in the region. Okay, I'll stop there for time. Thank you very much. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Next, Asya Tarpinia. Right? My, is my alphabetical uh, order correct? stop thinking here and I'll get to talking because I can see that the timer is going on right now. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about the stories of refugee struggle and survival uh, within um, coverage of Imperial Russian newspapers, periodicals. Um, the Great War caused... Can I just figure out this first? Okay. So the Great War caused unprecedented calamities throughout 1914-18 and affected lives of millions of people, both on battlefields and on home fronts. Am I? Yeah. Maybe you can come closer. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Um, the war that ensued on the Caucasus front uh, in November 1914 triggered enormous population movements accompanied by massacres, violent persecutions, rape, famine, epidemics, these population movements were the result of war and the genocide organized and systematically implemented by the Ottoman Turkish government against its Armenian subjects. 
By late summer 1915, hundreds of thousands of refugees, majority of whom were Armenians, had crossed the Ottoman-Russian border and created immense humanitarian crisis in Transcaucasia. Russian imperial government, both civil and military authorities, state-funded and public agencies, as well as local Armenian committees, organized and coordinated the relief effort on behalf of over 200,000 refugees crowded in Alexandropol, Echmiadzin, Erevan, Tiflis, among others. To reach out to various communities in all parts of the vast Russian Empire and make the voices of the refugees seeking for shelter, food, and warm clothes heard, the state and relief organizations uh, deployed the power of printed press. In my paper, I reveal how the contemporary periodicals uh, published in the Russian Empire, such as Armansky Vesnik, Berzhnyuts, Hambava Bej, Iskri, campaigned on behalf of the refugees and told their stories of struggle, self-help, and survival. I address such key questions as what did the central imperial periodicals focus on versus their local Armenian counterparts? Were they telling the same story? And what do those periodicals tell us about the relations between the empire center and the periphery? A number of newspapers and periodicals in Russian empire covered the population movements and the refugee crisis. The Bezhnets, which translates into refugee, weekly newspaper was published in Moscow in 1915, was entirely dedicated to the concerns and needs of refugees in Russian Empire. In contrast to most of the contemporary newspapers and periodicals, it did not offer illustrations or cartoons, which were very popular in those days. Instead, it published full texts of laws and regulations passed by the government to coordinate the life and movements of refugees. For instance, uh, the October 4, 1915 issue of this newspaper published the text of the decree or law about refugees, Zakon Abirzhinsov, that defined the refugee category in Russian Empire and focused on some of the central aspects of refugee assistance. The Bezhnets reported on effort of various relief committees and uh, trying to focus the public's attention on the urgent needs of refugees and the importance of everyone's participation in assistance. For example, the same issue of October 19, 1915 um, carried a column reporting on the relief efforts of the Moscow Armenian Committee that had been uh, sending monetary assistance, medical, uh, cloth assistance to refugees since October 1914. The column also included the address and the phone number of the committee's uh, Moscow office to encounter uh, uh, further assistance from the organizations to encourage them to participate. And for the same purpose, each of the issue of Bezhnets continued uh, to give information about not just Armenian, but also Estonian, Jewish, Latvian, Lithuanian, Polish uh, relief uh, organizations, mostly based in Moscow. Uh, the issues also carried a segment called Rosyski Bezhnetsov, which is searching for refugees. Uh, a common practice among periodicals printed in those days that aimed to help refugees find their lost family members and loved ones. What is uh, important to remember about this uh, newspaper particularly is how it focused on certain organizations and national committees' uh, operations in uh, assisting refugees. Why is it important? The All Russian Unions, for instance, uh, and the Zemstvo unions, these organizations were considered public organizations in the empire. That doesn't mean that they were independent NGOs in the modern sense, but they were not directly under imperial authorities' uh, control either. Historian of Russian uh, philanthropy, Galina Ulyanova, has assessed that, and I quote, Independent philanthropic institutions in the highly centralized empire acted as element of an emerging civil society, end quote. And the government, at times, saw the union's empowerment as a political threat to the monarchy. After all, Prince Lvov, um, who was the chairman of Zemstvo Union, was to become the head of the provisional government after the February Revolution. 
The headquarters of these organizations were not in Petrograd, they were in Moscow. And they had their various branches all over the empire, like the Caucasus Committee of All Russian Union of Towns that was had by Alexander Khatisyan, who also was the mayor of Tiflis. And throughout the war, the disagreements between the so-called public agencies and organizations and imperial government developed into confrontations, resulted in miscommunication in relief work. One of these disagreements concerned, for instance, the registration of refugees that first was done by these unions of towns and later was taken from them and given to Tatiana Committee, Tatiana Nikolaevna's committee, named after the princess and led by the imperial uh, uh, monarchists. So Bezhenitz covered thoroughly uh, the discussions between the public organizations about these developments, emphasizing that creation of united front in the struggle for refugee lives and clarity in division of work was necessary for productive relief assistance. Alexander Khatisyan mentioned the evolution of the antagonism between the Union of Towns and imperial authorities throughout the war in his memoirs as well. And these examples indicate the connections and continuities in the behavior of organizations in the center of the empire and the periphery and their relationships with an understanding of the state the monarchy, the mode of government and its practices, the emerging civil society in the Russian Empire, be it at the borderlands or in Moscow, had at times a similar, similar vision of the future of both political and humanitarian governance. Iskri sparks. Um, what was this? This spark was not mine. Um, Iskri illustrated literally magazine with cartoons was published weekly in Moscow from 1900 to 1917. And in 1914 and 2017, it actively reported on developments on war fronts and the situation in the rear in photographs. November 1st, 1915 issue of Iskri drew attention of its readers to the Caucasus front of the Great War. The front page carried the picture of General Nikolai Eugenich, the commander of the Caucasus army, very controversial, um, personality, especially when it comes to relations with Armenians. And the second page of the magazine was dedicated to the condition of the refugees. The article titled Armenia Bezhensi, Armenian Refugees, lamented the current war had incredible consequences for Turkish Armenians. It also brought up the total number of Armenians, Armenian refugees uh, that in Russian Empire was already about 250,000. The article included three photographs of refugee children in Ejmiazi. The first photo was taken in number two orphanage of Moscow Armenian Committee, which had good funding and was in quite uh, good condition. That's why also the pictures that you see do not actually um, terrify us when we look at the children. But the second and third photos depicted the orphans and their caretakers, nurses, administrators, at the orphanage run, uh, run by the Echnazi brother the aid. And this orphanage had been under a lot of pressure, less funding, and the photos articulated the desperate condition of those tiny human beings, famished, covered in rats, lined up outside the building, waiting for their ration of meal. These at times graphic images and detailed reports on the condition of the refugees, and especially refugee children, were quite common as we know in those days. While the providers of assistance, be they Armenian actors or Russian and other foreign, foreign relief workers, were actively engaged in humanitarian work, their graphic uh, descriptions of and comments on orphans' appearance, behavior, condition, were a testament to how striking and terrifying the reality was, and at the same time, how the so-called subjects of humanitarianism reacted to and perceived the so-called objects of humanitarianism. And as many other contemporary periodicals did, the East Greece piece on refugees mostly aimed at awakening compassion and empathy among ordinary people of the vast empire towards people in need. Yet the use of the images of vulnerable, helpless waves of refugees both by central imperial and local papers and actors simultaneously reinforced the hierarchies of humanity and the asymmetric relationship between the providers and recipients of the assistance. The notion of hierarchies and asymmetries uh, serves as a good segue to 
uh, my next topic that was also described and talked a lot about in the newspapers, periodicals, and that's the colonization of Eastern uh, Ottoman Empire's territories by, or the plans of colonization by Russian government. Throughout the war, certain officials like Minister of Agriculture and others were preoccupied with this question. Already in February 1915, Grivashein, the Minister of Agriculture, had suggested to Foreign Minister Sazonev that Erzurum, Van, and the adjacent areas were, and I quote, quite suitable for Russian population resettlement. And Hambaba um, Bej and other newspapers were act actually writing about this. Um, pointing to the colonization projects of Griboshein, historian Avetis Harutunian claims that Russian anti Armenian policy was obvious from the very beginning of the war. Peter Holquist argues against that, saying that Griboshein's project was only a suggestion never to become a policy. And however important and central this debate may be for us historians today, what mattered then is that the political instability in the Russian Empire during the Great War influenced the Tsarist authorities' decisions only, not only in the military front uh, in international politics, but impacted directly the refugees. As I said, newspapers were writing about this. Hamba Babesh uh, published this column called The Colonization of Turkish Armenia, describing these uh, conversations, the debates, even the expedition of, the, of Tatishchev to these areas to start the colonization. They also didn't forget to point at certain Russian uh, uh, dignitaries who would speak against this. So every single paper, for instance, made uh, certain to cover Pavel Milukov's speech uh, delivered at State Duma, where he called measures of Tsarist regime against Armenian refugees repressive and the colonization plans a continuation of Ottoman Turkish policies. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, the, I wanted to also mention that even with this information available, certain newspapers never forgot also to mention how Armenians were loyal to Russian Empire, bringing up, for instance, the meeting of Armenian representatives in Erzinjan with Grand Duke Nikolai, where they expressed their, um, they told about their physical and psychological trauma that they went through, but also expressed the hope and faith of Armenian remnants that their future safety and security was entirely intertwined with Russia's victory in war. And the final point that I want to mention um, is about how these newspapers didn't forget to talk about self-help and some achievements in refugee assistance. And one of these newspapers was Armiansky Vesnik, Armenian Herald, that, for instance, publicized a lot the One Armenian One Gold Initiative, saving the abducted Armenian women and children from Muslim households. And this campaign became so popular that um, Armenian children from different parts of Russian Empire would send money to the uh, editor uh, of Armiansky Vesnik to participate in saving these women and children from abduction. And this is a um, handwritten uh, letter written by Armenian girl from Astrakhan, Bartui Mazumyan, who in the end says that she uh, is requesting to send her the receipt that will show that the 90 rubles that she sent actually saved uh, lives of women or children. I will um, conclude with this and look forward to your questions. Thank you, Asya, for that informative and uh, punctual presentation. Next speaker is Aspik Kalapian. And I think everybody can hear reasonably well. Yes, we're good, in good shape there. Okay, excellent. Uh oh, we're going two laptops. Yeah. This one. High tech. Uh, oops. Sorry. Sorry. I have not touched it. No, that's, that's my fault. Okay. It's a bit high. Okay. Oops. Hi, everyone. 
everyone. Um, great to be here, and I thank everyone who made my presence here possible. So I will be talking about na narratives of atheism in forging a Soviet Armenian citizen. Uh, is it loud enough? Yeah? Okay. So uh, the agenda of the Soviet Union to forge a Soviet citizen was wide-ranging, stretching from brutal industrialization and education, family relations to eradication of religion and emergence of atheist Soviet citizen. Following the revolution of 1917, the Bolshevik leaders concluded that the long-term success of revolution depended on their agenda to cultivate a new social consciousness among the Soviet citizens. The agenda in their assessment required more than the exercise of political power and of the reshaping of the national economy. The emergence of an enlightened, educated Soviet citizen who would understand human existence in scientific terms was seen as the imperative of the day. As William Husband has argued, quote, no dimension of promoting Soviet values ultimately proved more important than attempting to alter the rhythm of the lives of individuals. Campaigns to reconfigure institutional, economic, philosophical, and symbolic relationships would succeed only to the degree that communist party ideals penetrated public consciousness." End of quote. Atheism and anti-religious propaganda were an integral part of this experiment. This paper looks into, a discourse, into the discourse and policies that constructed the anti-religious propaganda in Soviet Armenia in 1920s and 1930s, to illustrate the complex negotiation among Soviet power, society, and the individual in the forging of a new sense of citizenry. In the early Soviet period, the struggle against religion was manifested in two main directions, destroying or at least severely weakening religious organizations on one hand, and estranging the religious segment of the society from the church on the other. The first task, destruction of the church and clergy, proved to be easier and more controllable by the state. It was accompanied by the confiscation of church property and possessions, the exile and arrest of the clergy. The assault on the church began immediately following the establishment of Soviet um, uh, rule in Armenia in, 19, in November 1920. The People's Committee on Enlightenment, which would be the Minister of Education today, prohibited the teaching of religious subjects and any religious practice or ritual in the schools in December of the same year. In February 1922, Article 6 of the Constitution uh, uh, stated that the church was separated from the state and the school was separated from the church. All this meant that the church ceased to be a legal entity and no longer had the right to acquire property. This is despite the fact that the Soviet Union constitution of both 1924 and 1936 gave freedom of religion to the population and the Soviet Armenian constitution of 1922 stated that all citizens were entitled to quote, freely lead religious and anti-religious propaganda, end of quote. A fierce uh, persecution of the clergy and the faithful started immediately after the revolution with the belief that, quote, the church cannot be put on the same level either with trade unions or scientific educational or other useful for the working class structures. The influence of the church is highly corrupting, end of quote. While the destruction of the church and clergy appeared to be somewhat organizable and controllable by the state, chasing the faith out of the hearts of the faithful proved to be a more challenging enterprise for the state. Loyal to Karl Marx's famous statement, religions is the opiate of the masses, a patient, persistent, and long-term propaganda work with the Soviet citizens was launched. Along the government, although the government had committees dealing with anti-religious propaganda on behalf of the state, a new organization named Union of Militant Godless was emerged in 1925 to work directly with the urban and rural population to end religious practices among them. More so, a five-year plan was adopted aiming to conclude the five-year plan in four years. And this is that picture, yes? Um, in 1928, the Armenian branch of the Union of the Militant Goddess, Godless was founded in Yerevan. The same year, the Union started to publish its periodical entitled The Godless, Anastvats, with the slogan, with the slogan that struggle for religion is a struggle for socialism. 
Later same year, the first representations of the godless Bajichner, known as Bajichner cells, were created in rural areas. The union aimed to, quote, unmask the counter-revolutionary role of the church, uh, religion, of the religion and the church. The mission of organization was to culturally and scientifically educate the population through lectures, after work events at clubs, and reading halls, schools, and other educational institutions. In this project, the periodical was regarded as a priceless opportunity for the families. The drive to wipe out all religion from the lives of comrades was followed with zealous attempts to replace the notion of religious belief with one of scientific atheism. In this campaign, the faithful were rendered as uneducated and carriers of old rotten traditions and mores. This was understood as a struggle between the old and the new. In this discourse, the city, the workers, men, Red Army, the youth, those who believed in socialism and socially vulnerable were regularly equated with the new, whereas the village population, women, the clergy, the elderly, the Dashnaks, and those economically better off than their peers consistently represented the old. Similarly, those who identified with the anti-religious propaganda uh, agenda were regarded to be politically conscious, and those who preserved their loyalty to the church were labeled as backward. Due to time constraints, uh, constraints, um, I, it'll be, I won't be possible. It won't be possible to do, talk at length about the means and measures that the union adopted in their struggle against the faithful. Perhaps the most significant dimension of this struggle was that rather than eradicating religious rituals, holidays, and symbols, the union created alternatives to them. The most prominent example for this were the church holidays. For example, biblical allusions were used as vehicles for introducing atheist writings, such as the Ten Commandments of the Communist Party. Um, religious holidays were used for anti-religious propaganda. Christian baptism was replaced by what was known as red baptism. A red baptism was a festive ceremony with music and citations of party ideology during which the faithful were, were re-baptized into new Soviet citizens. New names of communist content were given to those re-baptized, such as Karl Lenin, which is Karl and Lenin, Mark Lenin, which is Marx and Lenin, Lenin which is Lenin and Rush, the Lenin's flag, and so on. This is real. It appears to Christmas and Easter. It appears that Christmas and Easter were the two holidays that the Union especially noted, perhaps due to the massive celebrations of them, especially in the villages. In comparison to the Soviet holidays, the religious celebrations were denounced as being morally corrupt. Um, morally corrupt. The clergy and church were ridiculed, portrayed as this diminishing, while the new system and the new citizen were portrayed as powerful and winning. And this is May the first, the workers day that followed Easter, and they were really looking forward to how they were going to contrast it to Easter to show that the, the corruption of the church, you know, alcoholism, beating wife, and in here you see all these well-doing people really celebrating. So. So. <laughs> And, and this is also um, uh, how church was ridiculed to show that they're losing their people, but also, you know, it's almost like fine pen differences. <laughs> you can see the clergy, uh, the clergyman, the priest is, um, has lost weight in the second picture, it's before and after, uh, has lost believers, and the angels are even in tears. <laughs> um, and this is again a picture showing that religion, the church is losing its members. Uh, this is to show the power of the emerging citizen over the clergy. Uh, and this is uh, the, the um, industrial city contrasted to the church, uh, which also says, I don't know if you can read it, it says, new Ash no, uh, no Ashtar, New World on it. So New World is this industrial setting with all the workers in it. This is another one, the industrial city emerging and the church is diminishing somewhere on the bottom. Uh, despite the optimistic images and anti-religious propaganda, was overall more successful in urban settings than in rural areas. Almost every issue of the journal expressed disappointment with the success of the union. The union was very severely criticized by the government in 1930 for its failure to clean the population of their pious lifestyles. 
More work was needed with the families. Church loyalty was understood in a hierarchical order of the family based on age and gender. Conventional party wisdom held that the young did not need to follow their parents in all things since the latter could be conveying incorrect anti-Soviet attitudes. And this was especially true for religion. Both the church and the union viewed the youth as the generation who would be the carriers of the values of the future, but whose present loyalty neither the state nor the church could take for granted at the moment. The elderly, on the other hand, were likely to cling on to religion, but they were viewed as less dangerous for the state because of their age. In the meantime, both the church and the union held that females were the most religious segment of the population, which was a threat to the families, given, given women, women's educative power over their children. Bolsheviks emphasized the importance of winning mothers away from the church. The Union of Militant Godless announced a goal of 40% female membership by the time of its old union congress in 1929. Illiteracy and insufficient education were seen as the true reason behind women's continued unscientific views of the world. Nonetheless, there was an understanding that in order for women to become more educated, they needed to be relieved from their daily domestic preoccupations. Liberation of women had to be grounded in a comprehensive remodeling of daily life, including the establishment of communal dining facilities, expansion of family support services, access to paid labor, access to abortion, and general redefinition of gender roles in the family. As William Husband identifies for the case of Russia, the problem was circular. The heavy domestic responsibilities of women prevented them from participating in activities in society that would raise their level of consciousness. The view that village women lacked in the sphere of political and social consciousness was held not only by male activists but also by experienced female party leaders. Since 1924, um, a periodical entitled Hayastani Ashkata Avorudi came into print with 500 copies uh, initially and grew to 8,000 copies in five years. The purpose of the journal was the implementation of women's, I'm quoting, the implementation, I'm sorry, the emancipation of women, especially the rural, rural women through elevation of their political literacy and through boosting working women's participation in public work in all areas of life by turning her into a direct participant of the construction of social, socialism in our country, and I quote. So this is the first one. Um, similar to the godless periodical Hayastani Ashkat Avorudi, a working class women, uh, a working, working women of Armenia, was associated fate with remnants of the past and the old Moors. The journal had a section entitled Baikar Hing and Sari Dem, Struggle Against the Old Lifestyles, which included a variety of themes including how to put an end to domestic violence, namely wife beating, how to fight against early marriages, against resistance to sending girls to mixed uh, gender schools, against physical and child abuse of children by supposedly well-meaning parents, against continued use of midwives and traditional healers, etc. The enemy of the socialists were the remnants of the past and fate was seen as part of old lifestyles. In July 1929, uh, issue of the journal reported regretfully that, quote, in our daily lives, wife and children, uh, child be uh, beating persists. The village men beat their wives. Villagers use the help of the healers. They go to church. We must lead a fierce struggle against all uh, these old traditions. Uh, here again, the, so, so uh, uh, shaming was really working uh, in this scenario and actual names of the people who were uh, abusers uh, were published with the names with the village so you could, people could actually go and find them. Uh, and again, shaming of a teacher who was uh, involved in domestic violence at home, questioning how he could be teaching at school if that's how he performed at home. The church and the religion were rendered as being serious obstacles towards women's emancipation and liberation. A lot of stress was put on education. It was believed that the economy would develop faster, quote, if our working women become fully educated when they acknowledge the role of science, use that science, and they throw away old habits and concepts which they have inherited due to the past ignorance and vulnerability. Um, religious mothers were condemned 
religious mothers were content for contaminating the future of their children. There was a need for social responsibility. The mothers would allow, who allow their children to participate in church rituals, and uh, such cases have been reported, commit serious crimes. Equally guilty are mothers who do not send their children to church, but indifferently watch their neighbors who do so. End of quote. Okay. So, um, Yet the real hope for the union of the godless for a truly godless society were children who could start from a new page. In this respect, schools were seen as the real hub for creating anti-religious children. Children's journals such as most prominently by Pioneer Ganch, the call for pioneers, uh, became the tool for anti-religious propaganda among the schoolers. Its content did not differ much from an average early Soviet newspaper. The addresses, this time, however, were children. The reports in the papers illustrate that children were regularly mobilized into anti-religious activism, such as distributing scientific leaflets among the relig uh, during the religious holidays, having educative, educative uh, conversations with their religious peers, organizing readings and other entertaining events only religious holidays to keep the school children busy in secular activities. Most prominently, the journal invited school children to help their mothers overcome their old religious lifestyles. Significant in this respect is an article published ahead of March 8, the International Women's Day. The article emphasized the role of children in helping mothers overcome their religiosity. The paper expressed regret that there were many women who did not fully took advantage of the emancipation, socialism, offered them. Pioneers were invited to promote the education of their mothers and sisters by taking care of the household and their younger siblings, thus giving the mother a chance to use the excess time to get educated. And I, I could say what happened later, <laughs> but I'll stop here and you can ask. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> But uh, this is uh, a regular, I still have, I think, a few seconds. This is a regular image that you could see, illustration that you could see in the newspaper, how women are uh, fighting their illiteracy. This is um, uh, the old, again, contrasted to the new family. Uh, this is red baptism by women in Dilijan that were so proudly reporting that 165 women and children had been baptized, re-baptized. Um, uh, this is again uh, uh, an illustration that women were overcoming this old way of using healers and now they were more approaching the real medical science and so on. Thank you. Well, we know how it all worked out. That religion was eliminated and never came back. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, yeah. <laughs> Okay, our last speaker is Harutun Marutian. Harutun. Uh, thank you. Uh, last time I made presentation here in 2004, that is 18 years ago, and at that time I received the possibility to speak 45 minutes. Now, <laughs> I can speak for a different time. Yes, so let's begin. So, socio political upheavals took place in Eastern European countries one after another in 1989, which historians later described as Eastern European revolutions. The Berlin Wall, which symbolized the dividing line running through the heart of Europe between the democratic West, so called democratic West, and so called communist East came down. In this way, the world socialist camp disintegrated and, two years later, the Soviet empire disappeared from the world map. Thus, the ghost of communism that haunted Europe from the time of Marx and Engels passed into history and simply became an object of research. A powerful democratic movement began a year before those events in the smallest republic in the Soviet Union, Soviet Armenia. This was, in my opinion, the pioneer of the Eastern European revolutions. As such, it had significant importance for the democratization of Soviet society and played an important role in the dismantling of the Soviet Union and hence in the disappearance of the threat of communism. Being the first, the Armenian Revolution 
uh, was not noticed, not perceived to be a revolution and remained unknown to expert circles. However, the patterns that developed in that unknown revolution could spread a new light for the research and evaluation of the Eastern European democracies that emerged at the end of the 20th century. The Karabakh movement began by raising a legal issue and a demand to solve it through legal means. Examination of the movement shows that Karabakh, although being the movement's main political problem, often served as the background in the search for solutions to many other vital matters affecting Armenian society. In them, it is uh, possible to see two main threads running in the parallel and growing closer together, the national liberation struggle and the implementation of democratic reforms. It gradually became clear that the success of the national liberation struggle and the solution of the Karabakh problem could only be achieved by democratic change. This process may be seen in, uh, very well thanks to the analysis of the movement's iconography. Posters and banners are regarded as special manifestations of national identity by specialists and tend to appear in great numbers during the times of crisis. As a rule, they accompany revolutions, mass demonstrations and radical changes in the life of a country which may sometimes last for years. Posters and banners, often first-hand indicators of the moods of the people, are sometimes created by political forces and contain colossal amounts of information about their times, thus helping people to better understand them. They are kinds of identity nodes that draw numerous diverse threads together. Only one of the elements of the political system will be addressed below, the change of perceptions and expectations regarding the Constitution. One of the Karabakh movement's most important achievements was the realization of the value of the Constitution of the Soviet Union and the unprecedented growth of knowledge about the opportunities provided by it. While the USSR Constitution was perceived before the movement began, to be a worthless piece of paper and the Supreme Council or Parliament as a place where all deputies, after some formal discussion, simply unanimously voted for draft laws presented from above, people gradually learned during the movement years to also value existing laws. All the Armenians have the expression Mernem Orenkin, which is uh, which is impossible to translate. <coughs> uh, they began to view the Supreme Council Parliament as a place uh, where decisions uh, should express the people's will and deputies make that will be heard. Special so-called constitution groups were created that worked with the deputies. One of the most important features of the Karabakh movement was that it was by its nature an example from, the beginning, uh, from beginning to end of a constitutional struggle. The questions asked were, first, on what occasions did people refer to the Constitution? Second, what attitudes existed? Third, what qualifications did they give to that fundamental document? What kind of constitutional topics did they discuss, I mean people? How and why was it criticized? how this was manifested in the iconography of the movement itself. I can see at least three layers in the posters and banners discussed below. They are, first, a belief that, in general, the USSR Constitution is providing possibilities to use the right of people for self-determination, and that the citizens of Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh want to use that rights. Second, uh, Realization of reality, that is, the Soviet reality is different and the Nagorno-Karabakh issue shows that the articles of the Constitution or the USSR Constitution aren't working. The citizens of the state are unable to use their rights and the conclusion is that the USSR Constitution is useless. And the third, in the Soviet reality, quite a lot is based not on the articles of the Constitution, but on the will of the leader of the country, who is commenting on the Constitution in his way. And that approach is leading the country at least to autocracy and maybe to an establishment of a totalitarian regime. 
The USSR was a, was a multinational and multi-ethnic country uniting many peoples, but only one of the uh, 174 articles of the country's constitution, the 70th, used the wording free self-determination of nations. It stated that uh, the USSR is, I am quoting, an integral federal multinational state formed on the principle of socialist federalism as a result of the free self-determination of nations and the voluntary association of equal Soviet socialist republics. I know uh, two uh, of posters with a similar emphasis from the February 1988 rallies. <clears throat> uh, one carried the slogan Trebuim Sama Prizilenia. You may see it here. Trebuim Sama Prizilenia, which is translated with demand self determination. Continuation is one word, but it is not visible. It may be assumed that the remaining word was Karabakh, for Karabakh. So, and the second, Sama Prizilenia, the slogan on the second was Sama Prizilenia extremism, that is, self determination is not extremism and probably appeared on February 24th and 25th. Why it appeared? Uh, the point was that uh, the two leaders of the Communist Party, secretaries of the Communist Party, Central Committee of USSR, Vladimir Dalgif and Anatoly Lukyanov, both arrived in Yerevan on the occasion of the February 1988 demonstrations. During uh, his speech on Armenian TV, uh, on February 24, Vladimir Dalgir characterized the hundreds of thousands of people attending the rallies in Opera Square as Gruppe Luzei, groups of people. On February 24, he repeated in, it in the newspaper Izvestia, the organ of the Supreme Council of the USSR, and then uh, on uh, the next day in Pravda, the organ of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the USSR. In a report published in Pravda, the participants of the peaceful demonstrations were described as extremist individuals. At the beginning of the uh, February 1988 rallies, and in particular those held in, on Opera House Square, started using the chant Plenum Plenum immediately after the publication of the decision of the Nagorno Karabakh Regional Council, expecting an invitation to a plenum that is special meeting of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of Armenia. One of the manifestations uh, of this was the banner that appeared on February 20th. Uh, the Central Committee uh, in Armenia, uh, yes, so uh, the Central Committee of the Communist Party of Armenia must put an end to criminal indifference on the Karabakh issue. This demand was, however, clarified uh, very quickly by the uh, protesters who began to shout session, session, referring to the convening of the session of the Supreme Council Parliament, the Republic's legislative body. A proof of this was the banner stating, we demand an extraordinary session for the Nagorno-Karabakh. I suppose somewhere here. The following uh, posters and banners were on display during the sit-in demonstration fixed above the Baramian metro station opposite the Presidium of the Supreme Council of the Armenian SSR building. The station's fascia carried a banner that articulated the protests main idea, which, since 1917, the time of Bolshevik Revolution, was the most uh, Soviet slogan, Psya Vlast Sovetum, that is all power to the Soviets, councils, with a question mark added. In fact, by displaying that banner, uh, the second article of the USSR Constitution was called into question, that is, the whole power belongs to people. The utili uh, utilization of that slogan uh, there and in several other places was because the motion to place Nagorno-Karabakh under Armenian jurisdiction had been adopted by the Nagorno-Karabakh Autonomous Regions Regional Council, that is uh, Sadet. That is the regional, uh, regional Council's session had expressed the people's will. A demand addressed to the Supreme Authority of the Armenian SSR was also displayed below this banner. 
Uh, uh, we demand a session of the Supreme Council of the Armenian SSR to satisfy the appeal made by the session of the Nagorno-Karabakh Regional Council. There was a student sitting demonstration on the Opera House steps where among various uh, banners and posters was, uh, uh, was the one, one uh, Prava Nazi Nasama Prizilani, it, it's here, uh, that is uh, the right of nations uh, to self-determination. There were also texts attached to the Opera House windows that stated the sit in protesters' basic demand. We demand, I'm quoting, we demand that discussions uh, that uh, discussions are held with the Supreme Council of the Armenian SSR to achieve a positive solution regarding the issue of re reunification of Nagorno-Karabakh Autonomous Region with the Armenian SSR. Okay, and uh, the next one, we demand that the Supreme Council of the Armenian SSR uh, in its session places the question of the reunification of the Empire with the Armenian SSR on its agenda. It, it's here. The sit-in demonstration near Alexander Spenzelian's uh, statue turned into, uh, turned into a hunger strike. The hunger strikers' demands were, I am quoting, to the Central Committee of the Armenian Communist Party and the Supreme Soviet of the Armenian SSR. We demand that a session of the Supreme Soviet of the Armenian SSR puts the discussion of the decision of the session of the Regional Soviet of Nagorno-Karabakh on the agenda and adopt a positive decision regarding it. We declare a hunger strike to reinforce our demand. So these are pictures from that hunger strike. A further reference to the Constitution was to be seen on another banner displayed at the release on Opera House Square in May-June. Uh, I am quoting, uh, the decision of the Regional Council and the decision of the Plenum of the Nagorno-Karabakh are not emotions. They, are, uh, they is the Constitution and uh, the will and judgment of the whole people. The text of the poster did not simply state the decisions of the Soviet government of Nagorno-Karabakh and the leadership of the Communist Party, but presented them in the context of the country's constitution. That is, uh, it emphasized their compliance with the letter of the law. It was previously mentioned above that at the rally of uh, June uh, 4, 1988, the task had been set to collect petitions made by at least one-third of the deputies of the Supreme Council about holding a session, which was achieved within a few days. <clears throat> that was also the aim of the poster with the text. Have you, have you met with the deputy you elected, which was born on in those days? Uh, the poster's pictorial section repeated the same slogan and the picture used in June 1920. The famous Did you sign up as a volunteer was created by Dmitry Moore or Lowe, a Russian artist and one of the founders of the Soviet political poster genre. In that Bolshevik propaganda poster, the image was of a Red Army soldier in a red Budzonovka pointing his index finger at the viewer, urging him to volunteer to join uh, the ranks of the Red Army. Yeah. So, so, two minutes, okay. Uh, just, I will read this one and then uh, the conclusion. A number of uh, banners and uh, a number of uh, posters and banners on the theme of the Constitution appeared at that point. They were of much more critical nature because those responsible for implementing the Articles of the Constitution, the old Union and Republican authorities, were not doing their job. Thus, by using the word Constitution, it's in Russian here, uh, it was emphasized that the implementation of its Articles actually depended on the will of one individual uh, whose word was decisive. A poster was displayed that uh, appeared sometime between the 2nd half of September and the 1st half of October 1988 with the word constitution made up of 10 letters shown 10 times 
with one letter disappearing from each line, ending with, the, uh, with just the letter Ya, meaning I. Characteristically, someone covered the first three letters up, um, replacing them with the word Pro, here, <laughs> with a pen, leaving Stiputia to be seen on it, thus suggesting the word prostitutes, uh, prostitution of the Constitution, which was later modestly covered with a piece of paper. Okay. A sister poster depicted something resembling... Uh, well, anyway, here are quite a lot of posters I'm not going to uh, tell about. Just, uh, just have a look. Created by people themselves. So, let's uh, go to the end. Uh, in my opinion, the above analysis clearly shows that the Karabakh movement adopted the constitutional uh, method of struggle from the beginning, becoming one of the most important keys to its success. It was no coincidence, therefore, that texts seen on banners and posters on the subject of constitution were the movement's mirror. In some cases, they directly rewrote, sometimes with an individual twist, the political texts heard at rallies. In several instances, the special and figurative uh, thinking of their creators could be seen in them. Quite often, interesting comparisons were made new words created, well-known formulas quoted but with new emphasizes, with unusual solutions being proposed. Texts that appeared on banners and posters relating to the subject of constitution were also evidence that the Karabakh movement was, in some aspects of the problems set before it, uh, <clears throat> kinguent with manifestations of the general swell of popular Soviet protests aimed at democratic reforms. The mind of the people is always busy. It's just that it often interprets known realities in its own way, looks at serious phenomena with humor, causes viewers to smile or laugh, educates them politically, offers new beliefs, carries out non-violent propaganda, forms uh, new uh, worldview elements and removes the fear formed over the, over the decades of Soviet rule, driving people to take bold steps. This is devoted to Gorbachev, who passed away just several weeks ago. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Harit. Uh, why don't the uh, four panelists ascend? as it were, and um, uh, my task as discussant today is to, to comment briefly on these four very interesting, challenging, and diverse papers that we've heard uh, before we open things up to general discussion. But I've tried to limit my consideration of these papers in the interest of time to uh, the framework implied or, or implied to me by the session title Narrative Practices and Power and in particular to the, the issue that comes up I think in each of them one way or another uh, of, of legitimacy. Armen Avkaryan focused on Baram's Chronicle. Let me turn on the timer for myself so that I don't go over my own time limit. And in which case I'll have to cut myself off. Uh, Armin Avkarian focused on Baram's Chronicle and its strategies of projecting the power and legitimacy of the Cilician Armenian kings, as well as its place in a tradition of Armenian historiography that sought to legitimize this or that ruler, but also how the Chronicle draws on non-Armenian forms and styles, if we can put it that way. He had several points 
draws attention to the power and importance of genealogies, how the Rubenians were legitimized by their ties to the Bagratids, how the Bagratids had earlier claimed biblical origins at a time when they strove for dominance with the Mamakonians, who were, in fact, obviously the only true legitimate rulers of our <laughs> I'm sorry, that was a little bit of editorializing on my part, but you know. Uh, I'm fascinated how this resonates today uh, at a time when everyone seems to be obsessed by genealogy and tracing one's origins, whether through DNA testing or scouring old records uh, for, for data. And I wonder if Armin has any thoughts on this, the similarities or differences between the use of genealogy in a text aimed at projecting the legitimacy of a state and its rulers, uh, and by individuals doing what? Uh, finding, using genealogy to find out who they quote unquote really are, uh, or, or where they really came from, or, or I'm not sure. Um, Varam's Chronicle uses genealogy to recast the history of Cilician kingship from a series of internecine power struggles and usurpations to a legitimate inheritance of the Bagratuni mandate, uh, Armin argues. But those of us who explore our own genealogy know that it can far more often complicate one's own personal history, and in some cases, literal, literally delegitimize who, who we think we are. Um, perhaps Varam's Chronicle itself reflects this complexity of origins in its use, as you pointed out, of elements of non-Armenian literary forms to assert the legitimacy of an Armenian family's rule. So does the text's construction tell us something different from what the words say, that in reality, genealogies are messy and nothing is ever as pure as we think it is? Um, Asia Darbinian discussed the coverage of the plight of Armenian refugees in various periodicals published in the Russian Empire during World War I, and posing the key question, what did the central imperial periodicals focus on versus their Armenian counterparts? And she touches on a discrepancy or different focus between some outlets that emphasize that Armenians were entirely dependent on Russia, our fate is in your hands, and others focused on Armenians' own self-help efforts. And maybe sometimes these two occur side by side with each other. I'm kind of curious about that as well. Was, were these differences within periodicals or difference of focus across different publications? So I wanted to ask, uh, if this was also a divide between Russian publications and Armenian publications, uh, or, or was it not that simple? Did Armenians, as I, it seems like you're arguing, try to legitimize their appeals to Russia, to, to Russians, by asserting their loyalty to Russia? And uh, you described the remarkable and apparently successful one Armenian, one piece of gold effort to rescue abducted women and children. How was this effort treated by Russian outlets? Were they, did they look favorably on it, or was it seen as too assertive on the part of Armenian state trying to take control of their own fate? Uh, and finally, the story of the second grade girl, Vardui, who sent money to rescue Armenians. And uh, in, in your paper, you explained that she asked to, to learn their names. Uh, I found really amazing and kind of moving. And I couldn't help but think of the, the say his, say her name movement in recent years in the US, which similarly, similarly seeks to rescue individual black lives from the oblivion of anonymity. And I welcome your thoughts on that similarity or dissimilarity, however you choose to view it. Uh, Harutun Marutian, in his close look at the posters and banners of the Karabakh movement, uh, at I am, let us remember, before social media and the internet, uh, like Armen, uh, Karyan focuses a great deal of attention on the issue of legitimacy. In this case, how the movement, through its posters, asserted the legitimacy of its cause by invoking a document, the Soviet Constitution, and the concept, the will of the people. He notes that the movement's placing of the Constitution at the center of their claims was a key innovation since it emphasized the free self-determination of nations and the voluntary association that it aligned and it aligned the movement with, or perhaps even placed it in the vanguard of larger efforts for democratization in the Soviet Union. Arjun argues that this movement was the pioneer of the Eastern European revolutions that followed, but it is not necessarily widely understood as such. And I would like to ask him to comment on why he thinks that may be the case. I would like also to ask at the risk of injecting current events into a historical analysis about the legacy of the Karabakh movements 
emphasis on deriving legitimacy from a constitution and from the democratic will of the people. Is this faith in democracy alive and well, or is it in danger as it is in so many states around the world, including this one? Uh, is the Karabakh movement's belief in democracy seen as a model or as a warning? And uh, Hasmik's Kalapian's paper is the only one, unfortunately, I didn't have a chance to read beforehand, but it, it covers the attempts to create a new Soviet citizen, uh, free from the burden of religion and of, of uh, faith, and the efforts uh, the state undertook to eradicate that uh, religious tradition within its populations. And again, I found the most interesting thing, the way, again, it uh, legitimized its effort, not by completely destroying the traditions, but by sort of hollowing them out and putting something new in, in, the, in its place. Not eliminating baptism, but creating red baptism. Not cre eliminating church holidays, but rebranding them. I don't know if that was smart or stupid, actually, uh, because on the one hand, it, it builds on something that exists. On the other hand, it leaves traces of the thing that it's supposedly trying to eliminate. So I welcome your comments on whether that was a successful, well, I guess in the long run, you're going to tell us whether it was successful or not. Uh, I'm trying not to spoil the surprise. Um, let me stop there uh, and invite you to respond, and then we'll open the floor uh, for questions. Uh, I guess I could start. Um, thank you so much, Mark, for that, uh, that really interesting uh, question. Um, yeah, although a lot of my work has to do with genealogies, I never really stopped to consider the uh, modern analogs that we have, like uh, DNA testing, 23andMe, Ancestry.com. I guess I was kind of shied away from that stuff uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, but uh, to, uh, to, to not leave the question unanswered altogether, I do see <coughs> other sorts of genealogies at play in uh, the modern day that do sort of match up to what I've seen in Bahram's Chronicle and in Moses Florinazzi's Chronicle and sort of this building of a uh, biblical genealogy for uh, the Rubenids and the Bakrakunids and what have you. Um, and uh, while it's not a DNA uh, genealogy, I have seen, for example, on the news or not so much, more on social media, on uh, discussions of uh, the recent, uh, you know, the Karabakh war and the most recent uh, Azerbaijani attacks on Armenia, that there is this sort of, um, this, this, this rhetoric that, you know, uh, Armenia deserves to be, deserves intervention from the international community because it is the first Christian nation. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about things like Noah's Ark resting on, uh, on uh, you know, Mount Ararat. As a as a sense of giving uh, giving us particular um, a particular sort of genealogy that is much more I guess um, familiar to me in, in my own research. Um, also, I've noticed that uh, Cilicia itself has developed a strange genealogy in the minds of uh, like modern. Um, Armenian nationalist movements, particularly in the diaspora. Um, I know growing up, I went to an Armenian school, and um, you know the Armenian history classes we had on the Kingdom of Cilicia was didn't really focus so much on the uh, Crusades or you know negotiating their position between the Byzantine Empire and the Mongol Empire. It was sort of um, it was described much more in the sense of a, a last gasp of you know, Armenian greatness before you know, the final nightfall came with the fall of Cease. And um, I feel like uh, Cilicia has sort of been used in, in Armenian pop culture these days almost as a, the genealogical origin, origin sorry, for almost a, like a diaspora state. Um, and I think that, uh, that that's, that's kind of an interesting topic, and I'd like to uh, 
do more work on the you know the afterlives of these uh, of these texts. That while um, maybe Vahram's chronicle was uh, relevant at the time, the idea that it was, for example, the the uh, folios of the manuscript, the excerpt of the manuscript that I was uh, putting up on the PowerPoint were from a 19th century Parisian edition. So the fact that these texts were being reproduced uh, up until the 18th, 19th century at the time when the uh, Armenian nationalist movement was really start starting to take off, I find that uh, it creates a very um, interesting and um, thought-provoking genealogy in itself. Thank you. Uh, 
there are quite a lot of uh, there are quite a lot of um, different approaches to uh, the question of what means revolution. Quite a lot of theories, and once upon a time, nearly ten years ago, I had a possibility to read two months in Berlin the uh, quite articles and books about the theories of revolution. And um, the, there is no one answer if what means revolution, but uh, a lot of authors are uh, quoting uh, John uh, Jed Goldstone's uh, article toward the fourth generation of revolutionary theory published in 2001. I'm quoting, an effort to transform the political institutions and the ju uh, justifications for political authority in a society accompanied by uh, formal or informal mass mobilization and non-institutionalized actions that undermine existing authorities. So from this point of view, and, uh, and not only from this point of view, what happened in, Nagor uh, what happened in Armenia, I don't mean Nagorno-Karabakh, I mean Armenia in 1988-1990 was a revolution. And I am planning when uh, uh, I will leave my position at the Genocide Museum to, uh, to write second volume of, uh, of my book, uh, uh, which you uh, know. Regarding <coughs> the, uh, was it okay or not to stress on the legal issues uh, as it was done in the Yetim during the Karabakh movement, as, at, uh, as it is not done in nowadays, I want to say that I suppose it is not only my opinion that in the case of Nagorno-Karabakh we need to stress on legal approaches for its solution. In 1988-1990 everything was done based on Soviet constitution and even declaration of independence of Nagorno-Karabakh in September 2, 1991 was based on Soviet laws adopted in 1991. So it is our problem that we uh, cannot use uh, that uh, legal basis uh, uh, to solve the Karabakh issue and our politicians are, uh, are uh, talking all the time what will uh, say Russia, what will say, I don't know, United States or European countries, etc, etc. So, but it is my opinion that we need to stress to base our uh, our approaches on the uh, legal issues and in that case only we can uh, reach uh, to some uh, to some good results. So, were there any more questions? Uh, uh, I, I, I guess the, the one question is: the, Does the in recent years has the Karabakh movement's uh, emphasis on constitutionality been adopted as a even though the particular constitution is no longer in effect, but the concept of it, of constitutionality, has that been uh, uh, built upon? You know, uh, there are uh, no articles, uh, no discussions, no, no research uh, continuing on the Karabakh movement. Everybody are talking about the nowadays situation, political solutions, possibilities, etc. Uh, unfortunately, only <laughs> me is continuing research, and there are uh, one or two dissertations about the about the about press uh, during the Karabakh movement, etc. So uh, that theme is uh, not so actual now as I would like it to be. Thank you. Yes, and uh, I'm uh, entirely my fault that Mark didn't have my paper. Uh, I apologize for that. No. Um, the question whether they were successful or not in, and why would they choose uh, religious holidays and come up with these alternatives to them. Um, uh, one explanation to that might be that they were very aware of uh, the massive illiteracy of the population and uh, very also uh, keen on making sure that they uh, um, personalized their address to, for example, the rural populations, their material that was distributed among the rural population and among the uh, population in the urban spaces were quite different from each other. They were very aware of their reception of, or with, uh, by their uh, populations. And I assume they just wanted to come up with these recognizable symbols and uh, 
somehow win the heart of the faithful through these recognizable terminology, recognizable symbols. Were they successful? No, for a variety of reasons. One major thing is that in these earlier decades of the Soviet Union, the state still was not the powerful entity, the, the, the powerful dictatorship that it had to become. Uh, that, and second is that it, they did not have, um, it was easier to prosecute the clergymen because then there was the institution and they go after them, but it was less so with the population when uh, especially they couldn't rely on the family to educate their children, to make their children until religious. So uh, they did not have the means and uh, infrastructures to kind of uh, uh, have a successful uh, agenda for that. Um, so, in the census was conducted in 1937, and the results were no, never published with the excuse that there were gross statistical errors in the census. But uh, the census results actually showed that uh, one third of the urban population and two thirds of the population, uh, two thirds of the rural population, still continued to practice religion, to go to church and practice the whole days. And this had been very disappointing. The, for the state. So that's why they did not, uh, uh, some scholars assumed that that was the reason the census results were never published. And the, the census that, uh, censuses that um, followed uh, later uh, this one uh, never included the question of religion uh, in them. We excuse that, oh, they're free to, is to practice whatever they can, but I guess the fear was that they would still be disappointed with the results. Um, and, by, and, and there was then no time really uh, between the early post-Soviet period and what had to come uh, because the World War II started then and then the state really needed the support of the church so they could not become as hostile to the church and the faithful and they needed also the internal mobilization so they could no longer be hostile to the, the pious um, population. So this was kind of the end of it, and when they did it, um, uh, after the revolution, they kind of, I, I mean after World War II, they found a more peaceful and tolerant coexistence with the church, and uh, the, the, in 1941, the Godless Union was uh, abolished, and instead, uh, a new um, uh, committee was uh, founded, affiliated with the government, called Society for the Dissemination, Dissemination of scientific and political knowledge, and that was the key to deal with. Thank you for just for the example. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we'll take questions. Pedros, you have a question? Yeah, I have two questions and one comment. One for Hasmi to comment. Is that, I mean, we see usually religions when they uh, are invented or where they, where they are spread, they do not they do not uh, delete or they do not get rid of the traditions of the local pre-religious pre that religion. You see this in the case of Islam, in the case of Christianity. I mean, think of the uh, Christianization of Latin America. Many local traditions. They adopted many local traditions. In the case, case of Islam, the whole pilgrimage itself is a pre uh, pre Islamic tradition. So this is the this is the uh, this is the concept of inventing tradition of Islam, etc. And uh, I see similar similar uh, effort here in, in Armenia of uh, of creating a new religion. At the end of the day, even I mean, communism is a type of new religion, even though it's not a religion, it is a religion to that extent. So. Uh, adapting itself to the existing norms, existing uh, traditions, because that's how that's how religions act. In order to justify their religion, they uh, adapt themselves to the local norms, or local religious uh, religious holidays, and turn them into their own religions in order to continue as a continuation. Uh, now, the question, husband, for you is: uh, at the beginning, the Soviet uh, experiment. Uh, uh, <coughs> Propagated the whole idea of the equality of women. There was a specific department, the Jantonte department was established to solve the women's question on equality. But then, 1935, uh, 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 they said that the women's question is solved, and they closed down the department, and you know, they started uh, you know, uh, inequality, etc. So I was wondering, do we see that difference in Armenia in the post-1935? Uh, 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 when 
the starting sales equipment, equipment question sold now. We don't, we don't need any separate department. Similar happened in the case of China and communist regimes too. Uh, the second question for uh, what more? No, that's okay. Please continue. Uh, for Asia, is uh, Armenians were referring to the Russian presence in Eastern Anatolia, Western Armenia, who has colonization. Did they view that as a negative? I and mean, the colonization, as we know, is a negative presence. You know, did they view it as negative colonization? There's no negative or positive, but did they view it in a negative manner? So. Um, I don't know. Uh, okay, thank you, Petros, for the question. Yes, there was a, a special department called Shenatil, women's uh, department uh, in Russian, that was dealing with Romish questions, and then it was. Uh, dissolved by Stalin's order in 1950s uh, with, the excuse, with the understanding that we've solved women's question, there's no longer women's question in the Soviet Empire. And of course the whole uh, ideology of communism as well, so not from Marx and Engels and from all the literature of communism, uh, they treated women as class and promised women that once we have the revolution you will be emancipated. But here the situation was very similar also to the world, Western world, uh, the second wave feminism when we look also into the Western society that uh, once uh, women had supposedly acquired the, the education that they sought, uh, they had access to job market, they had uh, voting rights, all of a sudden they started to see that uh, there was this new um, complaint that were emancipated but not liberated because they were not liberated from domestic labor and now they had this double burden of uh, going, having careers, being career women, career girls, but at the same time coming home and doing the domestic labor, so this created extra burdens for them. In the Soviet case that women were massively in the 1920s, uh, I really, I mean, on, in the evenings they were taught lessons and in the daytime they were pushed into the factories and workplace and, and into parties, you know, like every issue of, uh, of the journals that you read in this period says that women are not active enough in their political participation. But the truth is that nobody asked if women wanted that or not, yes, because at that moment they did not want it the same kind of uh, the same kind of um, uh, activities uh, that were pushed on them. Um, so, so, and again, this liberated, but you know, emancipated, but not liberated, was also very true with them. Even though the Soviets did go through a lot of things, to, including uh, you know building uh, nurseries and, and where women could go and breastfeed their kids right at the factory hours, so like really uh, all kind of possible. Uh, the, the communal kitchens when they would help each other uh, to cut down the time from domestic labor, but still um, uh, they were not happy with this outcome. I don't know if that's an answer. Yeah, thank you for answering. Thank you for the question. Yeah, I would like to clarify that absolutely. It was uh, it was negative. That's, that's how it was described. That's how it was perceived. And um, both in Russian language and in Armenian, uh, the colonizatia and taborum, those were the words which were uh, just defining a situation with which, against which uh, Armenians were pushing back because um, the article that I was talking about in Hambaba Bech, Turka, Dajka Hayastani, Gahtaboruma, they were describing um, how um, uh, the head of the resettlement administration in Russia was in territory, in those eastern territories that temporarily were occupied by the right of war, and uh, how he was examining them to see whether it was good for agriculture, but that they were sending non-Armenians there. So the colonization was going to be uh, by settling it with Cossacks or with Russian farmers, and even that same article mentions that the people who have already, apparently there were some groups already sent into that territory, even though it never came true because of the war developments and revolution and a lot of other aspects. But uh, there were even reports that there were groups of regiments sent to the area, and um, Armenians were complaining that the regiments consisted of anyone but Armenians and Georgians. So definitely it was seen as a negative. Because this debunks actually the Turkish 
approach that Armenians were, that the Russians were the savior of Armenia and that they were cooperating you now with this stuff. So, anyways, I'll stop here. Can I ask a follow-up question? It's, uh, Dutch Gahaya Sanitary Doctor, Dr. what about uh, Armenia and the government of Armenia? Did they see the colonization happening in territory that was conquered from the Ottoman Empire, or did they see colonization happening in the territory that was under Russia? Uh, it was, uh, this conversation was about the uh, bordering region and the eastern um, Ottoman territories. Uh, because Armenia being already the eastern part of Armenia being already part of Russian Empire with its Armenian population was just accepting all that escaping population. So um, resettling that area with, uh, with without Armenians was not any that was not feasible. Uh, what Armenians were really afraid of was that there was going to be this buffer made by Russian Empire between them and Turkey, and it would be made by the Cossacks mostly, who were the fighters, yeah. and it would be good for Russian Empire to defend its borderland, mm -hmm. but it would just be devastating for Armenians because um, they saw saving themselves with the help of Russians, and then they were also coming to realization that that was not really happening because the territories that they left were not expecting them, someone else was going to mm -hmm. go and settle. So that, I'm sorry, but I needed to respond to that final part of what you said about uh, debunking the... So, yes and no, because Armenians who were in flight, who were escaping Turkish uh, territories, I mean, Eastern Turkish territories, uh, uh, to Russian Empire, they didn't know at that point that Russian Empire was going to turn against them and not let them go back. So even today, maybe. Oh yeah, that's uh, yeah. But yeah, we, we do not learn from our history. I think we are the worst in doing that. Not that anyone else has been exceptionally great. But um, so at the point when they were escaping, they had hopes with Russia. So it doesn't really debunk the theory that Armenians would see, uh, uh, you know, a friend in Russian Empire. But once they appeared out of their homes, that's when they realized, oh, the Russian Empire also is not really treating us great. It's not, uh, it's, uh, not letting us return to our homeland. It's not uh, allowing us even to live in the territories within Caucasus where we want to. It's just sending us to random areas. So that's when the realization of that came. Thank you. Harry, I think want to add something. Is yes, 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 the yes. continuation of this discussion. Uh, was the put a question if uh, uh, the uh, enter of the Russian uh, army is a liberation or colonization? And I would suggest uh, the following in the 1920s, 1930s, in the Armenian Soviet Armenian historiography, there was a discussion regarding that uh, Russia uh, are there, uh, uh, were they liberating Armenians, uh, Tsarist Russia in 19th century and even during the World War I. So I may suggest to try to find connections between, 19, uh, <clears throat> between the discussions in the newspapers of uh, First World War and the discussions among the Soviet Armenian historians in 1920s, 1930s. Uh, I'm sure you may find uh, similar approaches, maybe. Thank you. So, <laughs> I'm going to switch directions, and I wanted to ask a question of Armin. Um, thank you so much. This is a wonderful panel, and my question is, um, so I, I, I learned so much, and I, I love this um, his chronicle and the monologue, and the way he developed these points that sort of grew out from it, these sort of virtues, if you like, um, of piety and martial prowess and the genealogy. And you showed at the beginning the portrait of Lebo, which is wonderful. And I wanted to know more, and I know this is part of Kaker project, about portraiture in visual and material terms in, in Kilikia, 
both in the group and in intensive periods, because it seems to me, and again, this may be something you've already thought about, it seems like there's an interesting possibility to think about tech, that other technology of communication, which is the painted picture, the inscribed monument, and I think there of uh, the genealogy of Toros the First, the Anavarza, which he puts in his inscription, and, and the painted portraits of kings, which might look stock, you know, conventional, but I think there's probably more there and to, to think about in terms of how they represent the figures, um, the royal figures, um, how they convey, specifically how they convey piety, how they convey um, prowess, whether it's martial or something else. So it seems like there's a wonderful opportunity with your chronicle to, to sort of compare, maybe contrast, with these other modes of representation. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to say, it's interesting to me, and I don't know enough about mono rhyme in Glickia, but it struck me, um, maybe it's interesting, maybe not, maybe it's common, but that Sarkis Pizak used mono rhyme quite, quite a lot in his colophons. Um, of course, he himself being um, a painter in Cilicia, I'm not sure if he, the, yes, he did royal portraits as well. So anyway, that was just a lot, but just to say thank you, and um, if you had any thoughts about that visual material, structural side of portraiture. Uh, no, th thank you so much for that uh, suggestion. That was totally, has been one of my blind spots. So for this project, I've mostly been focusing on different genres of literary sources, like you know these uh, versified chronicles, maybe just more traditional chronicles, you know, prose or you know, call phones of manuscripts, things like that, you know, to try to see the different ways that uh, these um, ideas of kingship emerge and how that varies with different genres. But to be honest, um, visual uh, media, like more like, uh, you know, epigraphy or uh, manuscript illumination stuff that's completely, hasn't even shown up on my radar, to be honest, except in the sense that, like, to just to show that, uh, just to like uh, establish a precedent that, you know, uh, the Bakratuni kings uh, would often have trappings of like a basset power in their poses of, you know, like God, God, I think it was Gandhi II who has the turban and is it, sitting uh, cross-legged in that one illumination, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. But I, I would love to talk more about that uh, to get some more thoughts and suggestions on where to take this. Thank you. That's right. So Mine is kind of related. So I, in, I, I also, I don't know as much as, uh, as Professor Martin about the time period, but I was, uh, you know, it, it, I was reminded of a, a chapter that I just read by Roy Khachaburian, and she's talking about the Yevangelists and the artists making uh, you know, narratives of lineage to architecture. Uh, uh, and so I'm, I'm trying, trying to place your example in a longer heritage of different methods of imaging, uh, of, 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 of um, creating legitimacy based on lineage, right? And uh, I'm wondering if there's continuations uh, and changes that you, if you have looked at previous, um, because there's a lot of Armenian texts that talk about uh, lineage, right? Uh, and whether you're seeing similarities and differences, especially in, in the genre, in, in your case, yellow poem, is that something, a new genre of uh, writing for, for these type of um, uh, lineage and legitimacy related narratives? Uh, in terms of its novelty, I don't know if I would go so far to say that what Bachman is doing is new. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there's certainly been other sort of genealogical mm -hmm. versified poems like Nersa Shnurhali um, Vipassana uh, Tum talks about uh, mm -hmm. another uh, dynastic history mm -hmm. that's versified. Uh, another one that I've been um, reading has absolutely nothing to do with an Armenian king at all, but it's written in Armenian. Freak's poem about mm -hmm. Arghun Khan talking about his genealogy and connection to Chinggis Khan and how this sort of uh, helps uh, establish legitimacy for Mongol rule in the Caucasus. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, there's definitely things like that coming up uh, in that time period. Um, but in terms of 
how these, what was one of your questions about how uh, this changes uh, across genres? Well, no, no in, in, that's what I was asking in mm. well, whether uh, that type of writing is done as poetry. Uh, uh, and yeah, it, and so one aspect you mentioned that uh, the, the poem is focusing also on the role of the kingship on um, securing Armenian people, mm -hmm. the livelihood of Armenian people. That struck me as something from a modern perspective, like very. Um, yeah, that made me nervous to write about that uh -huh. too myself. So so I'm, it seems modern to me. That but. was something new, for example, in, in terms of uh, establishing. Um, that element, I would say, like the specific like Armenian security element of it, was something that I hadn't seen before. And in fact, I mean, I was kind of uh, just pulling my hair out trying to think of like a pre-modern like a reason for this, but uh, mm -hmm. at the end, I just sort of tapped out. Um, but I, I have seen something like I, I mentioned earlier, Freak with the uh, Armenian mm -hmm. and Mongols, um, that there was this. Uh, there was this insinuation that because um, because Arun was the legitimate ruler, for example, mm -hmm. his success meant the success of the land, that the his territory would prosper with his establishment as a Khan, for example. Um, but nothing specifically targeting um, like the Armenian people. Like at the, at this time, I don't even know what Bahram means when he talks about the Armenians, you know? Mm -hmm. Is it people who follow the like the apostolic faith? Is it people who, you know, speak Armenian? It's really not clear. But there is this group of Armenians that uh, Levon is apparently like the steward of. That I, I mean, I guess long term, that's what that's what I'm trying to figure out. But I mean, it's still early days. Yeah, I actually had a similar thought as well. Professor Maranzi, when you were giving your paper on the, uh, how it would be interesting to compare the manuscript illuminations of the Hiroki kings with the uh, representation of kingship in the chronicles. Um, and I don't think it would take too much uh, for you to be able to do that. There's only like half a dozen or so of the illuminated portraits of kings. And I just wanted to mention that uh, Gohar Grigorian is someone who's written uh, on that. She has a recent article specifically on that. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Specifically on the manuscript illuminations of the Cuban King Kings. And so that could be like a starting point to kind of look in there and compare. It would be really interesting. Thank you so much. I think it's like such tunnel vision when I uh, start focusing on the uh, like written source and stuff. But I would definitely expand it into I have two questions, if I may. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one is uh, to our men. Uh, the, um, I call the word apocalyptic that you used in your presentation. That, and my question may sound theological. Uh, why did they try to uh, find their genealogy, biblical uh, genealogy? You know? uh, was it that they are they were trying to legalize their kingship, their kingdom, uh, putting themselves into these frames of the Bible, or they were trying to bring something new to the Armenian this new kingdom? You know? And the second question is uh, to Hasnik: uh, uh, Did this anti-religious propaganda carry out among the Islamic nations under the I, I 
feel a little bit of a complicated answer because of um, it, it, it's not entirely clear exactly I believe when Moses Horonazi wrote the um, his chronicle for the history of the Armenians, uh, but it was dedicated to the Bakhtarduni family, and um, I believe perhaps it might have been an attempt to create a sort of genealogical legitimacy for their rule because the pre-existing dynasty before the Bakhtarduni's were kings in like the fifth century were the Arsakid, the Arshakuni dynasty, and they uh, boasted a Parthian lineage. I'm thinking perhaps that because the Bakhtarduni didn't have this pre-existing um, you know, genealogy and because this is uh, after the uh, after Durkha's conversion to Christianity, that this was an attempt to um, draw a new um, pathway for the Bakhtarduni to be able to seek power by looking at their legitimacy through biblical lenses. Um, yeah. Because the term Kogarma is used only uh, two times uh, in the Bible. The first one is uh, in the days of Noah. Uh -huh. And the second one in the book of Ezekiel, where uh, these two kingdoms, Gog and Magog, mm -hmm. are battling within themselves. And uh, one is called, uh, call this kingdom of Pogarma to fight against Magog. So maybe they were trying to put themselves into this uh, battle of light against Forces right. of Marvel, you know, because they were highly uh, Christ, Christian, uh, you know, uh, thought mentality. That's a, I hadn't considered that. Thank you so much. I'll definitely look into that. Um, all day, I, I, I've come across so many great suggestions to look into, you know, the significance of Togarba and stuff. I'm, I'm so excited to get into this. Thank you. Can I just comment on that? Last point, and then it's okay. Um, just to like widen the scope a little bit, the attempt to write Armenians into the biblical genealogy goes back to the very first sources written in Armenian in the fifth century. Um, I think Togarma is mentioned already in either Babylon or Agathangelos, mm -hmm. like the house of Tlokama, as a, a way of referring to Armenians, and then even in Bodium, in the first text written in Armenian, the very first word of the text is Saskanazian, mm -hmm. which is a reference to other Jewish, you know, figures in the Old Testament, and he refers to the Armenians as descendants or of the Ashkenazi race. So, um, the Bible is obviously the, you know, believed to be the source going back all the way to creation, and so Armenians have their own, you know, prehistory, mythology, and they're attempting to reconcile it with this kind of authoritative source of creation to bring the two together. And so they find the right way to, to connect themselves with the sacred history, and that is there from the very beginning, even before the alphabet or whatever I'll ask another question. Please. Uh, no, this was not an anti Christian thing, this was an anti religious thing. I think uh, you know, after God bless had their uh, representations in most of the republics, and um, some of the religious fundamentalists that we saw coming back in the post Soviet period, especially in the Islamic. States, uh, former Soviet Islamic uh, republics that uh, were Islamic. Um, uh, yeah, so we can see that uh, religion became a very huge part of their this revival of the awakening of national identity in the post Soviet period. Um, this was not actually Christian, it was actually religious, and it was in the party ideology, it was in the whole ideology. Do you find some parallels to Western biblical royalty? 
can we say that uh, humanitarian action, as we understand it, arise? So but when I think about the 19th century, there, there, in newspapers that I read, it, there is call for help for um, Armenia in, in the East of the Ottoman Empire, right? Yeah. But it's not to the same uh, extent and power um, uh, of um, garnering empathy in, in the way that the and I'm, I'm wondering if, 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 the, if the type of, of movements of helping others change as a result of the um, I don't think I have a clear answer to that, but I know that those there were also photographs from like Adana massacres yeah. that also um, brought up a lot of conversation about the um, barbarity of the mm -hmm. type of the violence that was committed, mm -hmm. right? Like the photograph of burnt uh, body, mm -hmm. um, that, that's something that um, we had in the Jasa Museum, cool. and yeah, so the images, and the, the, they were even, uh, I mean, it's still, to, it's 20th century I'm talking yeah. about, so it's from yeah. the 19th century uh, that I thought. May I comment? Um, um, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. um, so, uh, 1890s massacres, were oh, there, yeah. and there were photos there, and there were for um, also to, to help to to get some funds for mm -hmm. Armenians who suffered. Uh -huh. so in Western media, in British media, we see these photos, mm -hmm. images of, um, you know, Gerfai uh, Evangelism, and the mm -hmm. image of this uh, Armenian woman with her children, which was mm -hmm. circulating. So it comes from uh, actually late 19th century. And yeah. it was used by the In the West. In the West. And in this case now, in the early 20th century. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I guess we can continue this conversation. Yeah. Let us have a question. Yeah, I had a question a while ago. I guess my hand. The, uh, I mean, you know that photography itself is a field of analysis. It's a, it's a different field. I mean, we as historians, we just present photography as as images, but there is a there's an in-depth field itself on, on photography and the power of the images. Uh, as I was telling Barak a while ago, that we have more images from the Ottoman massacres than from the uh, from the Armenian genocide. Uh, this has to do with the fact that uh, there were more European uh, presence there. They were allowed to take pictures. For example, if you go to the uh, to the Minnesota. Uh, archives, historical archives. You have the uh, whole Christie collection there, or 100, or not 100, maybe 50 or 100 images that no one has seen. It hasn't been published. But uh, the case I would like to make here is that both Armenians and missionaries have used uh, images of orphans specifically for the aim of raising money. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, we are uh, we are working on a new book for my series by the chorus by James Manikian and Robert Krikorian, who was one of the earliest of uh, the, the, the student of uh, Patriarch Garden Design, who introduced photography to Palestine. And uh, his, after the war, his job was only to take pictures of Armenian orphans uh, for missionaries. And that played a dominant role in raising awareness and raising uh, money. Uh, to attract uh, donors and uh, so, uh, but we rarely, I mean, the problem is that we don't have images from the Armenian genocide. We have few images. Uh, even that skull itself is not an Armenian, the, with the, the, the tower of skull. Tower of skull. Oh, that's not Armenian, you know, so we keep using that. That's a, that's by a Russian uh, artist, actually. But we have limited, uh, limited image. We think of Hartberg and the concert there and taking some images, but uh, we don't have uh, images from the uh, massacres themselves, uh, and that confines people to really make a case for Darwinians, hence they use children, and uh, you know, interesting use of children in order to, and women and widows to raise money. So we rarely see men as appearing as the ultimate object, object of these, uh, these, of these, uh, of these pictures. So, that's a that's that's another theme that needs to be uh, examined, you know, from from a photographic historian uh, uh, perspective, not from our perspective as historians.
What's the question, Becca? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> okay, very good, very good. Uh, I think that concludes. Yes, please applaud. <laughs> so, um, Mark? Yes. Uh, when do you think would be a good idea to take a group picture? Are we missing people here? No, it's important for you. Yeah, I think we are missing people. But tomorrow, I think we will, unless, unless people tomorrow. here are leaving and aren't going to be here tomorrow, then we should do it tomorrow. Yeah, you could. <laughs> or we could take two. One today and one tomorrow, and, you know. And then take the final decision, which one? <laughs> we vote, basically. Put it to a vote, and, yeah. uh, All right, so, but, but just one second. <laughs> I'd like to now comment on each of the questions. No, uh, <laughs> just just to an announce. So uh, Laura will have the bookstore open tomorrow during breaks and How lunch, about right, Laura? I don't know. And, and no. now maybe for a short time. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, dinner is at seven at Legal Seafoods in Cambridge in Kendall Square. Please, everyone, come. Huh? How do we get there? How do we get there? Bedros is an old hand at getting around Cambridge. So I'm, I'm assuming that people will probably go back to the, their hotel. Uh, we can meet does at the hotel. Does it make sense to go back to the hotel and then go there? I don't know the geography. No, I mean, so, I mean where, what are we going to do until 6.30? I mean, I don't have a problem, I can sit here or get around. But here's the question, how many of you want to go to the hotel? It's possible, but... Thank you. Yeah. It's not necessary. You haven't checked in yet, though.